basically in China, back in the 1970s, they surveyed how much cancer occurred and how much, of different kinds of cancer, by the way, much heart, how much heart disease, in a total of about 2,400 counties in China. So we organized a study around that observation. And so we organized it around selecting 65 counties across the country. Some were very high in a certain cancer, some were very low. And then we had two villages in every county. So we had 130 villages when we went to China and surveyed in considerable detail. We took blood samples and we took the urine samples and we asked questions and we collected food and analyzed food and so forth and so on. And uh, it turns out that in that collection of counties that we were comparing, we saw, for example, there was a 13-fold difference between breast cancer rates in the highest counties in China than the lowest counties. Their overall rate of breast cancer, but even the 13-fold difference, it was still much lower than here. We're much higher. So in some, some of those cancers, like, for example, um, gastric cancer, stomach cancer, or nasal pharyngeal cancer, which seemed to have a common etiology, uh, they were, esophageal cancer, was 400 and sometimes higher in the highest county than the lowest county. And then from these other studies I just mentioned before, people move from country, countries, in this case, from one country to another and change their diet, keep their genes the same. The, the, the uh, disease rates or cancer rates occur accordingly. They shift pretty rapidly. Well, that was in 1990 when the New York Times came out, as did the USA Today and Saturday, plus a lot of, a lot of organizations. Um, we were at that time uh, still kind of wrestling with our relationship with China. And so a lot of things that uh, news that came out of China, especially if the U.S. involved, uh, just I think got news in part because that was kind of a hot topic. Um, we actually had the first research project between the United States and China. It was also in science, uh, the New York Times called it the Grand Prix of, of all epidemiological studies. And it was the most comprehensive study ever done in the history of medicine. Uh, and eventually, so it, it, the study was also unique. I was there interested in not just what one thing does to this disease or that disease. I was there to see if there was a comprehensive effect of you know, all the nutrients working together that I had sort of gained some of that impression from the prior research that I had been doing in the laboratory. So I was really interested in, in, in China and seeing how if there are combinations of food, combinations of nutrients related to high and low risk of different diseases, especially groups of diseases. So it was a kind of an extension of going beyond the, what I call the very reductionist point of view that we tend to assume. This agent causes this disease by this mechanism. I didn't happen to believe that. So I went to a place in the world where we might be able to test that hypothesis and found evidence that was exciting. And the New York Times, uh, because it was the first project, I think, between the United States and China, obviously they took an interest just for that mere fact alone. Uh, but also it was because it was a very comprehensive study. And thirdly, it was a study that really kind of put a kibosh on meat consumption. So they interpreted it that way. I didn't quite mean it that way, but in any case, for those different reasons. In China, incidentally, our study was done in mostly in rural counties, because in those rural counties, 94% of the people in our survey, we had 6,500, by the way, 94% of those people in those rural counties were living in the counties in which they were born. So they're a very stable population. You go to a county and you select people, you study them. In other words, they were born there, they're eating local food. That was the other thing. So it was, from a scientific point of view, it was quite clean and quite nice. Go to the city area, it's not the same because they're getting food in different places. In, in these rural areas, um, blood cholesterol, these, these are averages. The mean cholesterol level in the lowest county compared to the highest county was from like 88 milligrams per deciliter in the lowest county. That's the average. It means a lot of people are under 88. 
The highest was 170. So they're in this range of 188 to 170. The, mean, the average was 127. In the United States, our lowest at that time was around 170, as that was their highest. And our highest was like 300. Our mean was like 220. So here you got the, China, the Chinese people down here, were up here. And from that, we could tell as cholesterol levels went up, heart disease tended to go up. That was one of the things observed in those days. We saw the same thing down here in the China data. It's a really important point because you got this whole range of possibilities. The Chinese represent this, our represent this, and the line went the same. Plato dealt through everything. So, what that said, it really put a, ne a very new picture on cholesterol levels because there was evidence at that time, some evidence, that people tended to believe that if we got lower than 150, we were getting in trouble. It was a higher rate of suicide, so it was said. Higher rate of colon cancer, of course nonsense. But that was being said. And so when I got the average of 127, I myself didn't quite believe it. And so I went back and analyzed all those blood samples by two more different methods, in different laboratories. That's what it was. So uh, the cholesterol levels in China were very low compared to us, and that's the kind of numbers that we now aspire to, you know, and want to consume this kind of diet. 100, 110, 120, something like that. Because we eat the wrong food. You know, our, our, uh, our uh, heart disease rates are so much higher, our can number of different cancers are so much higher, uh, and uh, that all is associated with our really much higher levels of cholesterol as an indicator, as an indicator, if you will, of the Western kind of diet. Uh, so I, my, my uh, interpretation of that information, considering the other factors that might be involved, like pollution or exercise and so forth and so on, um, the dietary effect is powerful. Really, really powerful. It's not everything, but it comes awful close to it. Yeah, that was one of the st statistics. You know, at the end of our study, by the way, we had a large amount of information on a total of, as I said before, 130 villages. And when I say a large amount of information, measuring lots of things in the blood, different kinds of food being consumed, we had 367 items of information. About, four, about 60 or 70 were just disease rates. All the other was blood indicators, urinary indicators, food indicators. Okay, so we had all this massive information, a big book. And uh, just to make a point, it turned out that in one county, there was something like 246,000 successive death certificates in that county that were recorded, not one was heart disease. 246,000. It just showed, it was an illustr illustration you know, of what's possible, you know, no heart disease. And when you put that information together, with what we're going to learn in the West, especially my friend Dr. Esselton and Dr. Ornish, you put that information, you go, oh, it's wow. When we got our data on heart disease and cholesterol, as I mentioned before, average cholesterol level is 127. In the United States, the general assumption was if you got below 150, you, you might have problems. And we were at 127 average. And as I said before, I, I didn't expect that. And so three, in this case, three uh, surgeons that known to me that were working in heart disease area uh, had never seen that either. And so that's why I went back and we measured it out a couple of times different laboratories. And, uh, and it, it supported what Esselton, Castelli, and Bill Roberts, three very prominent people in the field, in support of what they surmised might be true. But the general population view on this and the medical system on this was such, had suggested and gotten away with it. 
that we could be too low in, in cholesterol levels. And that put our data, I think, more than probably anyone else's at the time, uh, really questioned that whole assumption and showed that that's not true. And to change our views on that. That was hard, yeah, and, and that, that was a hard, hard one to judge. Uh, and I've often been asked that, can we have just a little bit of animal food? And we, we, can we expect to see something? Well, from other kinds of data, yes, it turns out that uh, there's a, the increase in risk of diseases from eating animal foods uh, goes, it starts as soon as you put a little bit in. That's what the line shows. But in reality, we know people can eat a little bit from time to time, not get disease later, not the kind of disease we might imagine, but they're in the minority. Really just, and, and the odds become ever, ever greater uh, that, you know, that the more they consume, the more they get, and the converse, if they're consuming less and less or down near to zero, they're gonna be similar to people consuming none. But here's the issue, in my view. If we just use a little bit of the wrong food, we continue to have that acquired taste for it, and we don't want to give it up. And a little bit leads to a lot over time. The best example of that is smoking. If, you go, if we're working with heavy smokers, this has been done actually scientifically reported, okay, quit smoking. Oh, you can have a cigarette or two every day. They go back, it'll stay there. So here's what, here's what the essential is, go to zero, stay there, not only because, well, theoretically and empirically, it's important, but it also allows our bodies to adapt to that. And we've done that ourselves. I've done that because I was always on the Western diet. Your preferences or the kind of food you want to consume changes. And it does it pretty fast, you know, in a month or two. And, uh, and so what that says, in turn, is that we're all kind of addicted to high fat, high sugar, high salt diets generally animal food, that's we're addicted to it. It's just the same as with caffeine, maybe nicotine with cigarettes, even some of the harder drugs. And addiction is serious, is a difficult thing to break. And so we're, we're addicted to the wrong food. And so I say, let's go to zero. Because there you will discover new tastes. You discover new health, of course, and you know you're, you're really minimizing, absolutely minimizing your risk of disease. So I like to say, uh, the goal, really my preference for this, here's the goal, go to zero. Not that I can defend, you know, every single person is going to get the ideal health for the rest of their lives. Because, you know, but, but the risk of getting those kind of diseases will be far, far less. And that's, that's worth a bet. If I'm going to a racetrack, I'm, you know, where I look at it, <laughs> it's the odds.